we cannot, you know, disavow the value of these interventions of, of a carnivore diet as well. If you look in terms of autoimmune disease, there are so many cases now of people having incredible improvement in, in autoimmune disease of the carnivore diet, you know, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, really bad psoriasis, eczema. We can't ignore these interventions and we need to continue the conversation around the things that we see with them. And Welcome to the Fat Emperor Podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. We're supported by the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity, which advocates a simple CT scan to reveal your CAC score. So know your score and take action to prevent that premature heart attack. Everything you need to know will be right here. Today I have the pleasure of meeting with Dr. Paul Saladino, who is not your average ho-hum doctor at all. He has quite unusual dietary habits and some strong views on cholesterol and other things that not every orthodox doctor would share. So great to meet you, Paul, finally. You too, Ivor. I'm a big fan and I'm so excited about this conversation about all things carnivore diet, and which many people may or may not be familiar with, but there's so many interesting nuances here with regard to lipids and autoimmune disease. It's going to be a great conversation. Yeah, yeah, I always love discussing these things, even though they are kind of fringe at the moment, and it might not be for everyone. And some people perceive carnivore as extreme, which is fair enough, but you could also say, say that vegan on the other end is extreme. So I think it's all about personal choice. You know, if you go to your family physician, whether it's in Ireland or in the United States, and you say to them, I'm going to eat a plant-based diet, they're going to say, wow, they're going to pat you on the back. You know, if you go to your family physician, I'm going to eat all vegetables and no meat and no animal products. They will pat you on the back right now and send you out the door with just a smile on their face, imagining that you are going to have fantastic health and live to be 120 years old. And if you go into your family doctor and say, I'm eating a carnivore diet and I'm not going to eat any plants. I'm just going to eat animals, nose to tail, like our ancestors did. And we can dig into that. Uh, they, they will absolutely lose their shit. Um, you know, they will, they will freak out. They may fall over. They, they might, they may grab you by the shoulders and shake you and say, what are you doing? You're crazy. Um, and so I, I, I've been super fascinated by the evolutionary origins of where humans have come from and, and kind of this concordance between our book of life, our genetics and the way we're eating. And I've come to believe very strongly over the last year that humans evolved as animal eaters primarily. I had a really interesting conversation with Miki Vendor, who's a paleoanthropologist on my YouTube channel. And you can look at these recent studies that have come out looking at nitrogen levels and Neanderthals and early Homo sapiens from 70, 80,000 years ago. And they pretty clearly suggest that the nitrogen levels were so high in our collagen that we were eating, we were high level trophic carnivores. So the concept of humans as carnivores or primarily hunters is only strange to us in the last 70 years as, as he westernized humans on this planet. I think evolutionarily, there's an argument. And then if we actually look at the biology and why we maybe don't want to eat all plants or some people might want to eliminate plants completely, it makes a lot of sense. But it is, it is a pretty radical concept. And I'll admit that even I, when I first heard about it, thought, that's crazy. But as I really dug more into it, I realized that there was a lot of conditioning there and there's a lot of stuff that doesn't really hold up to scientific rigor when you look into it for reasons for eating plants or reasons not to eat animals. So it's a really fascinating conversation. Yeah, I must say I'm very drawn to it, even though I'm careful to always stress. I mean, I, I work on behalf of a, a charity to identify people with heart disease before they have a heart attack. And I think our main message really is no processed food, no sugars, no seed oils, you know, eat a, a safe diet, especially people with heart disease. But this whole thing about more extreme diets, if you will, is, is, is fascinating, interesting. And it's an emerging discussion that should be discussed openly regardless. So I might just, just for the record, I mean, you're a full medical doctor with approximately how many years experience patient clinical? I mean, at this point, over 12, 12 to 13 years. Yeah. And you also, it's quite clear from a couple of podcasts I saw you on, you do extensive research outside of your, your standard clinical practice uh, in lipids and in obviously everything to do with diet and nutrition. In fact, I, I saw one uh, discussion you had with Bio Lane, who 
who doesn't particularly like me, but that's okay. I like him. And uh, I must say you, you lorded over that conversation with actual data studies like machine gun one after the other. And we'll probably touch on some of those today. I'd love to. I'd love to. Yeah, I think that um, I am. I have a healthy obsession with understanding the roots of chronic disease. And I've always been fascinated by connections between our diet and chronic disease. And throughout my medical career, I've had this kind of suspicion almost from the beginning, not quite from the beginning, but once I got into medicine and started seeing how it worked in actual patient care, I really had this growing strong suspicion that food is connected with, with chronic disease. Perhaps one of the most strongly connected things, probably the most strongly connected factor. And so there gets to be this sort of fascinating conundrum, this fascinating puzzle. What are humans supposed to eat to obtain optimal health? Is it different for every human? Where is our, where is our user manual? You know, when you guys buy a car or I buy a car in the United States, it comes with a user manual so that when, when the strange light goes off on the dashboard, you're like, what the heck is that? I don't know what that means. You look at the user manual or you get a flat tire. You look at the user manual. But I really would characterize a lot of this sort of quest of mine as like, I am on the quest for the human user manual. And it may be different for you than it is for me, but I would argue that there's, there's increasing evidence and perhaps there's a fundamental diet that most people can eat. And then we can build on that and some people might tolerate more things than others. But I, I think that this quest for the human user manual is so fascinating because it translates into quality of life for all of us. And, you know, chronic disease affects many people and I, and I'm sure you just, I want to, I want to live the fullest life I can. I want to have the highest quality of life at all times. And so I want to know how my, how my vehicle, how my metaphorical vehicle works. And I want to drive a Porsche. If I don't want to drive a Honda Civic, if I can drive a Porsche, I want this vehicle to work as well as possible. So I want the user manual. I want to know what type of gas to put in this car. I want to know how to fix the flat tire when it happens. And we don't know what that is. And that's why I love these conversations. But I really appreciate what you're saying there, and I couldn't agree more. I think that you can create a tiered system or a hierarchy of how people can think about improving their diet. And I think that the first step, I, I couldn't agree with you more, is elimination of processed food, elimination of sugars, elimination of oxidized seed oils, perhaps all processed seed oils. I think that if, if more people did that, we would see incredible benefits. And then, you know, you can move up the chain, and I'm sort of perhaps at one extreme end where I see a lot of patients with really recalcitrant autoimmune disease. And for those people, I sort of think, well, as we'll talk about later in more detail, maybe elimination of all the plants can improve that. Maybe plants are causing autoimmune disease for some people, but for the majority of people, I think an amazing first step is just elimination of processed foods, elimination of seed oils and elimination of processed sugars. That's going to help everyone. I can't disagree with that. Yeah. That's in alignment as well with between all the different even extremely different camps. So we kind of know last hundred years, chronic disease came, came of life and we have massively increasing rates over the century. And we know the things that are new, processed foods, seed oils, refined sugars and refined carbohydrates. Um, but the other things we talk about are not new. And 100, 150 years ago, people had all kinds of diets with real foods without chronic disease. So there's a big commonality. But We'll get into, yeah, the carnivore thing. One challenge with carnivore is vitamins, minerals, things like these that you might be missing. So most people would, I agree, and all the paleoanthropologists, I always send on Dr. Michael Eads' three blog posts, Are We Meat Eaters or Vegetarian, part one, two, and three. And every time anyone asks me about this, whether we evolved in that way or not, I send on those three bog posts and he has the nitrogen, the carbon and all the evidence. So I agree with you, but that's where we came from. But now, nowadays, if you go on nearly exclusively meat, what kinds of things might you be missing or what are the arguments made uh, as to what you're missing? Well, one of the things that I'll say is that the carnivore diet is kind of like a keto diet in the sense that, you know, I, you know, I'm using air quotes here. When people say keto, you don't really know what they mean. You know, when people say Mediterranean, you don't really know what they mean. When people say vegan, you don't know what they mean. And when people say carnivore, you, you have a general sense, but you don't really know what they mean. You know, a vegan doesn't eat animal foods and you know, a carnivore doesn't eat plant foods. But the way that I would recommend people construct a carnivore diet is different than the way that many others in the space are suggesting people construct a carnivore diet. 
The first thing I would say is I want to disabuse people of the notion that a carnivore diet from an evolutionarily pers evolutionary perspective is meat only. I, I think of this very strongly as nose to tail eating. And what that means is that just like our ancestors would have done and just like we see indigenous peoples doing today, when an animal is killed, it's killed from a respectful place and they appreciate the sacrifice that the animals made to persist to give them, you know, the ability to continue living and to feed the tribe. And they eat the whole animal, both out of respect and out of nutritional considerations. To not eat an animal nose to tail is to be both disrespectful of the resources that we have on this planet with animals and also to neglect, you know, the granular nutritional knowledge that we've acquired over the last 100 years. I mean, we don't know 100% of what humans need, but we have a pretty darn good idea of the nutrients that a human needs, whether it's vitamins, minerals, cofactors, and what's amazing to me as I've dug into this nose to tail way of eating an animal is that if you look at an animal and you eat that entire animal, that animal will provide, animals do provide all of the nutrients that a human needs in the most bioavailable forms in the optimal ratios. It's this incredible, elegant sort of, uh, sort of paradigm that, and the last part of the equation is that without any of the plant anti-nutrients or toxins. So I've argued this before. I, I would say that an animal eaten nose to tail is the ultimate multivitamin for a human. And, you know, we can break down specific examples of that, but I don't think there's any better food for a human in terms of bioavailability, in terms of the proper ratios of nutrients, and in terms of um, the total cumulative sum of all the nutrients that you can get. And so we can certainly break, I'll, I'll say a little bit about individual nutrients that people worry about. And if you look at an animal, in my opinion, there is nothing missing. And if you just back up a little bit, you can, it, it kind of makes sense intuitively. That animal is a mammal, usually, and it's very close to the way a human looks. I mean, our biochemistry is not equivalent to a duck or a cow or, uh, you know, a sheep, but it's very similar. Our biochemistry is much more similar to that than it is to a brassicate vegetable, you know, to a mustard plant. And so the way that that biochemistry works is just like ours, you know we're going to get an animal, the animal's operating system, I've also talked about this, is, is, is essentially equivalent to ours. Their biochemical operating system, the way they're built is very much like a human, not entirely, but it's very similar. They're compatible. But a plant operating system is completely different than a human, and it often doesn't work well with human biology. And, and when we eat only plants, we are definitely going to get nutrient deficiencies. But if we eat an animal nose to tail, we will get everything we need. Now, as I'm saying that, <clears throat> perhaps the first thing people will imagine is that the, um, the, the, the nutrient that will be most efficient in would be vitamin C. And I did a, a really interesting conversation with Bart K on my YouTube channel about vitamin C. And what we find when we look at animal foods is that there is vitamin C in animal foods. And there, would, there, there has to be. And there's a decent amount of vitamin C in liver. And there's actually a, a reasonably you know, usable amount of vitamin C in muscle meat. And if we look at studies from the 1940s and 1935 and 1945, they did these crazy studies that would never have been repeated now on conscientious objectors. And they gave some of these conscientious objectors scurvy by completely limiting vitamin C. It took six to eight months for them to develop scurvy. And what we know is that scurvy is essentially a disease of collagen synthesis. In order to make collagen, you take a, a strand of collagen, which is a single fiber of collagen, and then you have to uh, you have to hydroxylate it, then you have to glycosylate it, and then the hydroxylation and the glycosylation will allow the collagen to form a triple helix. Well, the first step, the hydroxylation of collagen, uses vitamin C. So what do we get when we get scurvy? We get all problems with collagen synthesis. We get bleeding gums. We get petechiae, which are little red dots on the skin, suggesting breakdown of microvasculature. We get problems with collagen everywhere collagen is. And so because we can't do that first hydroxylation step of collagen synthesis, what they found was that once they gave these people scurvy after six to eight months, it only took 10 milligrams of vitamin C a day, and perhaps could have even been less, but that was the lowest dose they gave people, to reverse the clinical signs and symptoms of scurvy. And what they found was that there was no benefit to any more vitamin C in any of the metrics that they were checking. There was no clinical benefit, there was no serologic or biochemical benefit, meaning that they couldn't find any evidence. I mean, this is, again, the 1930s and 1940s, so what kind of blood tests were they doing? But they couldn't find any evidence of any benefit to vitamin C above 10 milligrams a day. So this gets into this really kind of counterculture notion, like 
are we really using vitamin C as an antioxidant as much as people think we are? This is the Linus Pauling theory that megadoses of vitamin C are good for us, which I would argue very strongly with. And most people, when they take vitamin C, will take 1,000 milligrams, which is potentially, you know, 100 times more than they need in a day and can have serious consequences. For people with G6PD or glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, we know that that much vitamin C can cause hemolysis. We're getting a little bit granular here, but what we see is that vitamin C can turn into an anti, can turn into an oxidant molecule rather than an antioxidant at high doses. We also know that vitamin C can turn into oxalate when you overconsume it. So my argument here is if we look at carnivores living now, you know, people in the space, there's no evidence of scurvy in anyone that I've ever seen. And we can also look at, we now can look at inflammatory markers. We can look at markers of oxidative stress. DNA damage, 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine, lipid peroxides, and these don't get elevated on lower than what people would consider to be needed levels of vitamin C. Maybe 40, 50 milligrams of vitamin C is what I end up getting in a day from liver and muscle meat. And it's all the antioxidant markers look fine. There's no scurvy. And as I would argue um, in, in you know, sort of corollary, the higher doses of vitamin C are probably hurting people. So it's a very counterculture idea, but if you look at the science, it really seems to hold up and it's quite a fascinating concept. So the idea that we need the amount of vitamin C that you can get in fruits and vegetables or, you know, you know, citrus fruit is, is not true. And there's plenty in, in animal foods, um, other minerals and stuff. Yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah. And I think as well, well, the, the requirement for vitamin C uh, while being all much lower than they may believe, also, if you're not processing a lot of sugars and carbohydrate, I believe there's a lesser requirement for it uh, again. Uh, but there is one thing. Uh, if you cook the hell out of your meat, I, I think you will tend to destroy the vitamin C. So you want to be rare, I'm guessing. Yeah, I mean, that's the idea that, that there are cases of scurvy in Arctic explorers and people who were on ships because they had preserved old meat. So you want to you wanna make sure you eat fresh meat. But if you're eating fresh meat and you're eating fresh organs, you know, if you're eating an animal nose to tail and not absolutely making all your meat well done, I don't think there's going to be any concern of scurvy or any concern from an antioxidant perspective of vitamin C. So there's, there's no deficiency there, just what we see clinically and scientifically. I think the evidence is fairly strong. And beyond vitamin C, there's really no argument for any vitamin or mineral deficiency. I mean, it, the, the really, really strong, clear case is that animal foods have all the things we need in more highly bioavailable forms than plant foods. If you look at beta carotene, which is a precursor of vitamin A, well, there's preformed vitamin A in, in animal foods, which is the retinol form of vitamin A. If you look at iron, animal foods have so much more highly absorbable form of iron and heme iron than plant foods. Many people get anemic just eating plant foods. This is the same thing with niacin. It's nicotinic acid versus niacinamide. And nicotinic acid is found in plants and it's not processed in the same way as niacinamide, which is found in animal meats. And again, it's this operating system concept that plant foods have different forms of these vitamins, minerals, and cofactors that are different than what humans use. And we are then tasked with an extra step. We have to convert them into our usable form. And some people don't do that well with certain polymorphisms with regard to beta carotene. We know there are polymorphisms in BCMO. It's just better to get the animal form. It's more highly bioavailable. So if you look at the nutrient content, wow, animal foods are clearly the multivitamin. They're the clear winner in all of these in all of these camps, whether you're talking about B vitamins, whether you're talking about, you know, minerals, whether you're talking about other things, it's, it's just, it's not even a question. So I think it's pretty clear if people look into the science that there's, there's, you're not going to get a deficiency if you eat nose to tail, meaning it's important to eat the muscle meat in addition to the organs. I would argue there's a strong uh, need for connective tissue, which is higher in glycine. And then people need to think about an omega-3 source, which would have often been in the fat of the animals, whether the bone marrow or the brain, or they can eat seafood for an omega-3 source. It's also important to think about where you're getting your calcium from, and we can talk about a calcium-phosphorus balance as well. But um, I think a lot of people in the carnivore community are neglecting to think about where their calcium source is if they're not eating dairy, and um, that can uh, imbalance calcium and phosphorus ratios. But if we're eating nose to tail, and eating the bones of an animal or eggshells, we'll get plenty of calcium and, and it all kind of works out. I mean, it's so amazing as a physician, I love learning about physiology and it's neat to see it all come full circle and say, oh yeah, it all worked out just fine. And of course it would because I'm eating an animal that's essentially very similar to a human in terms of its biochemistry and its nutrient content. Yeah, and I'm watching an interest too because I've dabbled a little in the science, uh, not too much actually compared to some of my other 
specialized subjects. But I've been interested to see that largely what you're saying rings true. And very interesting data around this now emerging from the existing literature from yourself, Amber Ahern, uh, and others who are researching it. And uh, yeah, you would look and say, the default assumption would have to be you're getting everything unless there's a compelling piece of data to say there's something big missing. But, but that missing data seems to be genuinely missing. <laughs> so we'll see. What about um, the quality of the meat? Because one thing that I've discussed at length with people is if you're eating grass uh, reared, you know, healthy animals, properly managed, everything you say, I'm sure, rings true. Uh, but what about the whole problem with the massive amounts of factory farmed meat, especially in the US? It's kind of been a race to the bottom with potentially hormones and feeding with feedstuffs that could disturb those balances of fats. Just that whole area. How important is it to eat good, real food meat as opposed to processed? Well, I think there's no question that we should be eating real meat as opposed to processed meat. You know, the processing of the meat if we're talking about like deli meats or sausages or, you know, the processing of the meat is certainly going to take away from the nutrients, especially vitamin C, like we mentioned. And I think the discussion around grass fed and grain fed is, 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 is nuanced. It's, it's very interesting. Certainly I think that, um, you know, we have to look at the way that cattle are fed and, and how they're fed and what's on the grains. This is such an interesting discussion. I think that for the longest time I, I, I didn't understand this because I've never been a rancher and I've never been on ranches and seen the way cattle are raised. But, you know, what, what I was recently educated about from a rancher is that when grass is growing, you know, I definitely think that the best cattle, the, 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 the ruminant that I would prefer to eat would be a, a cow, a piece, uh, like a cow that's been living its life on a very green field for its whole life. Rather, I don't want it to be in a feedlot if I can avoid that. But one of the things that a rancher educated me about was that the grass that they're eating will often turn to seed at certain times of the year. And so the cows do eat some grain and it's a natural thing for cows to eat grain. And that grain is going to be organic, quote unquote, you know, that's not going to be factory produced grain that can be moldy and full of glyphosate and these things. But the idea that cows would eat grain is it really sort of opened my eye and I think, oh, wow, like that kind of makes sense that a cow actually probably wants to eat grain because a grain is going to be very nutritious for that cow. When given the choice, when the grass actually goes to seed, they will eat all the grain off the top of the grass first. So uh, I do think that when we put cows in the factory farming situations, we have to really be careful about the quality of that meat, the quality of the you know the treatment of the cow and the quality of the grains that the cows are fed. But I would, I would, I would have no problem eating a cow that's been eating, you know, grain that's growing on grass in the field, you know? So I, I think I just want to introduce the idea that there's a little more of a nuance here in the discussion. But yes, I think that the factory farming is probably not great. Um, and I think that the work of Alan Savory is quite fascinating. This gets into kind of the ethical conversation and the idea that perhaps if we allow cows to graze in a more uh, evolutionarily consistent manner, they, they don't eat all the grass right down to the roots. They'll graze a little bit and then move somewhere else and move somewhere else. And when they're on the field, they deposit manure, and that increases the quality of the soil, which increases the carbon-carrying capacity of the soil. So he's, you know, people can look him up on, on uh, YouTube. He's done a great TED Talk. But the idea, which is so counterculture, is that one of the ways that we could increase the carbon-carrying capacity of the soils and decrease the overall greenhouse gas emissions that we're seeing in the world is by having more ruminant animals who are eating grass, who are managed appropriately. So I thought this was such a cool concept and it kind of speaks to this idea like, yeah, let, let the buffalo roam again. You know, when the buffalo roam, it's like that song, you know, in, in the States, you know, about the buffalo roaming. When the buffalo roam and, you know, when the cows roam, it's probably going to increase the carbon carrying capacity of the soil and increase the quality of the meat. And so, yeah, I think it's important to think about the quality of the meat, both from an environmental perspective and a health perspective. Um, processed meats, probably not a great thing. Yeah, and I I think the the processing of the meats, certainly the deli meats and all heavily processed, I suppose you could consider if, if cattle are uh, held in pens and fed glyphosate sprayed grains way more than they normally would eat, and then they're injected with hormones and antibiotics, I suppose all of that together adds up to a lot of processing, even though it's a real animal. But like you say, you know, if, if it's done with certain limitations, with, with clean grains that have not been 
covered in roundup and, and other things that may not be so bad uh but this will be this will be debated for a long time yet to come the thing about the environment's a big one because i hear it, even my children hear it in school and debates around saving the environment and they sometimes ask me well how do you speak back to someone who says that the animals are destroying the farm animals are destroying the environment and i say well basically you say that there were way more ruminants you know and bison than we have now hundreds of years ago roaming the earth and back then there was no global warming and if you look at the carbon dioxide and the global warming issue or global impact and look at the graph of our problem and it goes right up from the industrial revolution onwards right there were more animals grazing before that graph moved so it can't be the animals but in by some definitions just a quick break to remind you that this podcast is only possible due to funding from David Bobbitt and the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity. For middle-aged people, it is imperative to find out your heart attack risk by getting a CT scan of the heart and your CAC score. The new IHDA.ie website has all the scan resources. Please support us by visiting and sharing widely. Knowing your score, you can take action to stop the disease process and save your own life. It can even be as simple as removing sugar, refined carbs and seed oils, i.e. processed food, from your diet. And now we return to the conversation. I mean, if you look at the studies that are done with greenhouse gas emissions, whether it's carbon or nitrogen or any of these other ones, I think most people would have a hard time debating the fact that the majority of greenhouse gas emissions come from industry and technology. I mean, the, like 70 plus percent, you know, it's just... You know, and then if you look at this, if you look at the statistics, and again, these these statistics can be massaged, and so you have to be very careful how you how people are massaging the statistics. Unfortunately, there's a lot of political agendas at play here. But the the most reputable data that I've seen suggests that agriculture, which is combined plant and animal agriculture, accounts for between 11 and 13 percent of the total greenhouse gas emissions. Well, if you break down that amount of agriculture, it's about 50 50. You know, like animal agriculture is four to six percent, and Plant agriculture is four to six percent, you know, of the total greenhouse gas emissions. People want to believe that that the cow farts are causing an issue, and that's just that's false, you know. That's just not the case. Um, if you look in the science, it's just not true. Yeah, and 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 exactly, and I, I love that distinction you made there because it's one thing to say that modern agricultural practices rearing animals are problematic. That, that, that may be fair enough, and we should pull back all the, uh, the elements of that. But to actually blame the physical animals for their, for their farts is absurd because there were a lot more of them hundreds of years ago, and there was zero global wa warming until we brought in industrial methods, fossil fuels, coal. You know, that, that's, that's the big change, if you will. And I think if people look at it, 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 won't, be, it won't be crazy for them to imagine that when an animal poops, that's fertilizer. We use horse poop to make beautiful plants, you know? Like an animal is depositing back much nitrogen-rich things into the soil, and that increases the soil's carbon-carrying capacity. So it's just crazy to think that it's cow farts. You know, Bill Gates and the senator, you know, who's talking about this really need to be corrected. This is not true, and this is the problem. So yeah, I think if people dig into the environmental aspects of this and the ethics, they'll be surprised. And I think that, you know, there's, there's some really compelling arguments that putting more ruminants on the earth will, will give us a little bit longer time on this earth before the greenhouse gases get to be too accumulated. And it will also provide more nutritious food for people. And that's the other piece of the equation. Cows eat grass. Humans can't eat grass, you know? Like, we don't, we don't need that land, you know? It's not even tillable land. Cows can pasture on land that's, you know, rocky and it's up and down. It's hilly. You can't even make crops on that land. So to say that cows are using space that we could use to make other food is wrong and, and humans can't eat grass. And so basically cows are turning grass into steak, which to me is the most magical thing you could imagine. I mean, one of the most magical things you could imagine. They're, they're, the, they're the magical machines, you know? And I was recently talking to a guy who's from the Northern part of Europe and he was saying, yeah, in the winter, the reindeer turn moss into steak. And it's like, yeah, humans can't eat moss either. So these animals are really, are really an integral part of our, our life cycle. And we cannot separate animal agriculture and, and plant agriculture. We need plants for animals to eat. 
and, and to just get rid of the animals would be a catastrophe for this planet in terms of health outcomes for humans. And I, I believe environmentally, it would be a big, big problem as well. Yeah, manage them correctly and properly and with ethically, and it's great. And the only problem, if any, is modern intensive methods. I was meeting with some um, artisan farmers a few days ago to tell them all about the calcium scan, and we'll get onto that shortly, and to discuss, you know, real food uh, and its ability to prevent or treat disease. So I filled them in a lot of the science that you might have heard me talk about before. But they went through various methods in farming, and they said it really is a challenge in Ireland now. And one example of many they gave was slurry. Now, the word slurry in Ireland is the stinking liquid mess that they spray over the fields to uh, fertilize them. And basically, they're from penned in animals standing on slats and all of their stuff, right, their crap goes down and they gather it in enormous tanks. And then later they suck these tanks out into huge vehicles and they spray it on the land. And it's a kind of a smell pollution thing. And you can also get runoff into rivers. But the interesting thing was these researchers who were with the team I was with, they said, if you actually compact the feces with straw, like was always done in the sheds, and then you take that out into the fields and piles and you turn it like they used to do to let the air at it, you completely change the nitrogen that's in it, the fertilizer, into a completely different kind of nitrogen compound. So the slurry actually ends up with ammonia type nitrogen, which is not a good thing for the earth and can damage earthworms and damage the soil in the liquid feces version that's been stored without oxygen. But the turned uh, feces mixed with straw and air exposed becomes fantastic for the environment. So it, it just shows you that humans can take something fantastic and through intensive methods and practical you know, optimize methods, turn it into something not so good. But anyway, that that's an aside. <laughs> it's such an interesting thing. And this is the theme you continually see, or I continually see is that there's so much wisdom in what people were doing before us. You know, we have incredible technology and you and I are talking over the internet and this magical, you know, we're talking through the air, you know, <laughs> this is a crazy thing. But I mean, this is just my, my rant, but you know, we shouldn't forget the wisdom of our forefathers, you know, our, our, our ancestors, whether it's how they raised animals, how they ate animals, how they, how they dealt with, you know, animal products. And there's a lot of wisdom there. And if we're losing that, we're, we're losing something really valuable. Yeah. Well, I'll skip, skip gears now uh, to, yeah, we're going to get into cholesterol and stuff and also how we really identify people with disease rather than going through the tea leaves or the chicken guts and trying to guess from risk factors if someone may or may not have a heart attack problem in the future. And I'll just qualify, as I always do, that I work for Irish Heart Disease Awareness. And David Bobbitt, who founded that, discovered he had enormous heart disease in 2012 and realized that very few people are using the scan and they're using the chicken guts and the tea leaves, looking at cholesterol. And we know from the research that these measures of cholesterol and other risk factors are very ambiguous. And we know you've got to look to see the disease itself to, to save people who are at risk. So with that said, um, there are people who eat an unusual diet, uh, like carnivore or low carb or keto, and some of them, their cholesterol does go up. Uh, a lot of them, it doesn't, and it doesn't have to, especially older people on low carb. But on keto and hardcore, it often goes up. So maybe a bit of your experience. I think you've dealt with Dayspring and maybe Peter Atia's researcher talking about this LDL versus whether they really have a risk or not. Maybe a little around that. This is a fascinating discussion. And I, I love that we can get into this because I haven't really done a deep dive. So maybe we'll do a moderate dive into LDL and cholesterol here, but I haven't really done a deep dive on in cholesterol in any podcast. So this will be very valuable for people. And, and I've appreciated much of your work on this topic and refer people to many of your videos. It's a very misunderstood concept. I would agree with you uh, on, on all of those counts. I do think a coronary artery calcium scan is very valuable for people and we can talk about the applications of that. And I have seen in my clients and even myself that my LDL number has gone up. So let's just break it down for people a little bit. At least here in the States, most people, when they get a cholesterol panel, will get an LDL, an HDL, a triglyceride, a VLDL, and a total cholesterol. 
And the units on that are milligrams per deciliter, which is essentially a density measurement. You're looking at mass per volume, which is density. And the problem with that is that it doesn't take into account how many particles make up that, that density of LDL. It's just giving us sort of a weight of LDL particles, if we're thinking about LDL. But it's not telling us how many particles that is. And so, you know, I've had n- numerous conversations with Tom Dayspring, and I've, uh, I'm, I've listened to a lot of Peter Atiyah's conversations with him. And, you know, there's, there's a push now to look at LDL particle number which is the units are nanomole per liter. So a nanomole is 10 to the negative ninth moles. So if we get into really some of the granular numbers here, I think people may find this quite interesting. So a mole is uh, based on something, uh, a number from Avogadro in chemistry. And uh, Avogadro is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, which is a very big number. So when we're looking at a mole of any element in the periodic table of elements, whether it's magnesium or sodium or whatever, one mole of that element is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules or atoms of that. Or it could be, you know, you can have a mole of, of a molecule, which is more complex than an element in the periodic table. So when we're saying nanomole per liter for LDL, we're talking about, you know, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd times 10 to the 9th. So you can do the math, you end up with 6.02 times 10 to the, what, uh, 14th. Um, uh, did I do that right? Yeah, 10 to the 14th. So I would say that, you know, one nanomole of LDL means you have 6.02 times 10 to the 14th LDL particles. That's one nanomole of LDL. 6.02 times 10 to the 14th is a huge number. That is 14 zeros, right? 14 zeros. Um, and that is crazy. But then the, the numbers we see for LDL on these particle counts are between 1,000 and 2,000. You know, I've shared on social media, my LDL particle number is between 1,600 and 2,000 nanomole per liter, meaning if you actually counted the number of LDL particles in the sample that they're looking at, they're getting, in my case, say 1,600 times 10 to the 14th molecules of LDL. That is a huge number, right? Huge. We're talking, I mean, almost an astronomical number. A million is 10 to the sixth. A trillion, you know, is 10 to the 12th. A billion is 10 to the ninth. So, right, we're talking, oh, excuse me, I think I messed this up. Anyway, people get the idea. Like, we're, we're talking a big number, more than a trillion. You know, we're talking thousands of trillions of molecules. Now, the LDL particle number arguments go something like this. You know, if we look at LDL particle numbers, in some populations, they have been shown to correlate with atherosclerotic coronary vascular disease. However, the problem is that sometimes they don't correlate with that. As you've pointed out, you know, there are populations in the world for who the LDL particle number is higher, and you actually don't see an increase in cardiovascular disease. And so we will come back to that idea of how many actual LDL particles there are, because I think it'll help people understand this. But The other thing I would posit in this situation is that in order to achieve an LDL particle number of 1,600 or 2,000 nanomole per liter, that's essentially only possible on a ketogenic diet or with familial hypercholesterolemia. This gets into a little bit of the work of Dave Dave Feldman, and he's often put out on social media, please send me a study that shows that an LDL particle number or that a high LDL in people without familial hypercholesterolemia with high triglycerides and low triglycerides, with high HDL and low triglycerides actually shows that there's a risk to this high LDL number. And no one can show it because the study's never been done. We've never done a study that I'm aware of or anyone that I've ever seen on social media can point to where we've studied a population of people like we see on ketogenic and carnivore diets. That is people who are insulin sensitive, a low fasting insulin reflected by usually a a relatively large particle size, which is in, uh, you know, nanometers, a high HDL, a low triglyceride, but they also get a high LDL. So I would say this is a divergent phenotype of LDL that's never been studied, but what we are doing is using data from people who have high LDLs in the setting of insulin resistance or familial hypocholesterolemia, and we are conflating that data as a predictor for these people with high LDL particle number. I'd be curious to get your thoughts on this, but this is just my thinking is that it's so interesting to me that it's really hard to get an LDL particle number that's that high unless you're doing something like ketosis or carnivore, which I would argue are very evolutionarily consistent things. But you can also arrive at that LDL particle number through familial hypercholesterolemia, which involves a genetic mutation and is a completely different situation. 
it's, it's actually pretty hard to arrive at an LDL that's that high with insulin resistance, but sometimes people do. But I think that what's happening here is that we have a divergent phenotype of elevated LDL that we need to study. And we need to say, is this actually the same thing as an LDL of 1900 nanomol per liter in somebody with insulin resistance, where you would have a condition of low HDL, high triglycerides, small LDL particle size. They look very different. These are divergent phenotypes. And yet we're, we're sort of lumping them all into the same thing and saying, this is a risk for people. And of course, you know, all these physicians are well-meaning, but, and there's a lot of litigation in this country. And there's a concern that if we leave people with these high LDLs, are we putting them in the position of being at risk for you know, coronary events, which is where I think something like a coronary artery calcium scan can be very beneficial in terms of differentiating risk moving forward. As you and I know, if someone has a high LDL particle number for a couple of years and they get a, they get a coronary artery calcium scan and the score is zero, you can essentially say your risk of having a coronary event in the next 15 years is very small. You know, maybe 1%, something like 1% in the next 15 years with a zero coronary artery calcium scan. So I think it's something that we're going to keep using in the future to generate data and to generate information about these people with this divergent phenotype of high LDL numbers without, without concomitant insulin resistance. It's just this strange thing that we've never seen before. And I fear that we're using data, we're using ideas that are centered around insulin you know, resistance rather than insulin sensitivity on these high LDL numbers. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, no, that's a good summary that essentially the particle number is a risk factor. It correlates in certain populations with more events. As you said, there are populations around the world who have higher particle numbers on average than Americans. And those populations have almost no heart disease, lowest in the world. And the Americans have the highest heart disease. So there's a there's myriad exceptions. Uh, more recent ones for me is Dr. Gerber. I know as a patient with a three thousand plus uh, particle number nanomol, and has been watching carefully. And what Gerber does is he always informs them with all of the knowledge, and and then they can make their own choice. So this person chose to continue with their diet, but they're making an informed choice. Interestingly, the person four or five, six years ago, quite a, some time ago, had a zero score and recently got one again. And a zero score came back again. And the person is in their 50s. So there are many other examples I won't get into with serial zeros in calcification, which is the ultimate test for disease presence in people with very high particle counts, but who don't fit the phenotype of insulin resistance, uh, sad diet eating, you know, where the high particle count reflects the problems of a bad diet and insulin resistance. So I agree, but the system, the system, like you say, it's litigious and also the system screams for simplicity. So the whole medical system seems to have gravitated to, well, rather than looking at the complexity of what you discussed, uh, we'll just say it's the particle number is the biggest thing and get every doctor to just look at the particle number. But that's a disservice, though, to people when it's only one risk factor of many. So I'd agree. I think uh, absolutely the calcium scan is crucial because mainly to find the people who have big disease so we can intervene and they can lower their numbers or whatever they need to do. That's the crucial thing. But to reassure people who who are in the situation that you describe. And with serial scanning, they can check back in a few years. And if there's still a low score or no real progression, they know they have very little atherosclerosis inside. And they can make the personal decision to continue to have a high particle count. Uh, I guess the problematic person is, is one who, who gets the impression they can change their diet their particle count can go up and maybe inflammatory markers and they're probably fine where they might not be. I, I guess you need some expertise to read the blood markers to ascertain. Uh, some people might react badly to a ultra low carb keto diet and rather than being insulin sensitive, low inflammatory markers, everything good except maybe a higher LDL, they might actually get some genuinely bad markers going in the wrong place might react badly? I think that that's where, you know, a, a functional medicine physician comes into the equation because I, I haven't really seen it in my clinical practice. Generally, there's something else going on in that situation. But, 
yes, you would, when people send me lipid panels all the time on social media and they say, what does this look like? And all they send me is LDL, HDL, triglycerides, total cholesterol in milligrams per deciliter. And I say, I can't say anything about it. it. I need to know fasting insulin. I need to know HSCRP. I want to know fibrinogen. I want to know your ferritin. I want to know your thyroid. You know, like it's a very, it's not a complex. And I love that you bring up this equation, this idea that we are really trying to oversimplify things in medicine. And I think it's because many of these concepts are quite complex, but it does the patient a disservice because people getting put on statins is not a small decision. I mean, statins are, are real drugs. They are going to have major side effects for many people. I can't tell you how many people I've seen. Um, before I uh, was a physician, I was a physician assistant in cardiology and I worked for four years in cardiology and I saw many patients who had myalgia, memory loss, you know, problems with sexual function, with statins. And I'm not saying that statins don't serve a place and haven't had some data to show that they improve outcomes in terms of secondary prevention, nor am I saying statins are the worst thing in the world, but I'm saying they are serious drugs, just like any drug we use, you know, whether it's a proton pump inhibitor or a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, none of these drugs are benign. And it really kind of irks me when physicians say like, oh, this drug is totally safe. It's not totally safe. So to put someone on a statin is a very serious decision that people need to be aware of. And I think that there's becoming this knee jerk reaction. Your LDL is high. You're going on a statin. Well, in my opinion, that's, that's a disservice to the patient and the physician, though they may be very intelligent and well-intentioned, is not considering all of the risk factors nor all of the data points, which would it go much beyond the cholesterol, as you're saying, to give a real sense of what someone's overall picture looks like. Because let's just revisit the idea of LDL particle numbers, and I think people will understand this. The way that LDL probably forms an atherosclerotic lesion is by moving from the vasculature, meaning from moving from the the blood vessel space inside the blood vessel to the intimal layer, the subendothelial layer of the blood vessel. So it's actually going into the blood vessel wall. Now, an LDL particle is between 20 and 22 nanometers. But if you look at the space between the endothelial cells that lie in the inside of a blood vessel, it's about 70 nanometers. So it doesn't really matter how big our LDL particles are. They're always going to move into that subendothelial space. And I've heard you talk about this, and I think it's a great thing to point out to people. It's not just moving into the subendothelial space. It's becoming oxidized either in the blood or in the subendothelial space, and then being retained in the subendothelial space. This is in the blood vessel wall. It has to be retained there in the proteoglycan matrix. It has to be seen by a macrophage as an oxidized LDL particle, and it has to trigger you know, the pathogen-associated molecular pattern receptors, the toll-like receptor patterns on the macrophage, and then get taken up as an invader. So when our LDL is taken up by a macrophage, it becomes a foam cell, which is a precursor of a fatty streak, and that's what an atherosclerotic lesion forms from. So there's some sort of immunologic thing going on. The LDL has to become oxidized. But the arguments around LDL particle number would suggest that, okay, the more LDL you have in your circulation, the more of it is going to get into the, endothel the subendothelial space just by a, a rule of osmosis, just a concentration gradient. But one of the things that speaking with people in the space has really pointed out to me is that that's a really absurd thing to say because when you actually look at the numbers, what I was saying before holds true. Think about my LDL particle number, 1600 times 10 to the 14th particles of LDL. And you're, the difference between, if I had, an, if I had a, an LDL particle number of 1,000 or 900, people would say, oh, you don't have any, you're not at risk. The difference between 1,600 times 10 to the 14th and 900 times 10 to the 14th is essentially zero, right? It's not even an order of magnitude. People need to see how big these two numbers are, right? To say that that is the, that is the basis of atherosclerosis is a concentration gradient, you, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's absurd. Like, I have... 1600 times 10 to the 14th and someone else has 900 times 10 to the 14th like those are i mean it is twice but the relatives like the relative you know it's just insane like we're talking a lot of zeros here and either way even if you have 900 times 10 to the 14th you are you're gonna that's a huge number of particles and that's a, still a huge number of particles to get into the subendothelial space just in terms of the actual osmotic gradient and the, and, the, and the actual, you know, concentration gradient. So to say that that's what's going on is absurd to me. It doesn't really make sense. Like, yes, someone can have a smaller number of particles, but think about it in, in the grand scheme of things. Like, the, the scale is just enormous. It's, yeah, it's like the system is super saturated because there's such a vast quantity of them. 
you're essentially kind of super saturated and more going in or out when they can freely go in and out. This has been said by Dayspring. It's just not going to be the lever. But you also have to say, well, you have populations where you know they have higher numbers and you know they have the lowest heart disease in the world. And when you start putting these facts together in a logical map, you realize that surely the particle number is overwhelmingly more a reflection of a potential underlying issue than in and of itself a concentration gradient. But the problem is that that is more complicated, but, but it's awkward. It seems they are screaming for the simplicity that more particles, more problem. It's a tricky one. And in your chats with Thomas Dayspring or, or with Peter Tias, I think you talked with his researcher. Did they convince you of anything? Well, you know, Tom is Tom is um, is Tom. Tom is Tom is Tom. Tom is one of the people who is an expert in the field of lipidology. He knows the literature and he's very concerned about this. But, you know, he he freely admits to me we don't have the studies on, you know, LDL and people who are insulin sensitive and they probably will never be done. And so his perspective is, therefore, we have to go by the data we have. And my perspective is, hmm. I think we need to continue the conversation, you know, and I think the studies need to get done. And so it's just a difference of opinions. I mean, he's right. You know, we don't have the studies and he's trying to say, you know, we don't have the studies. Therefore we have to go with the data that we have and make the best decision we can. And I would say, we don't have the studies. We should do the studies and we should continue the conversation because I am not convinced. And, you know, with my clients, I have the conversation with them in a very frank way and say, Hey, this is what the literature shows. You feel good. You know, we don't have data here. The data would suggest this is the case. What do you want to do? And I offer them the decision. And they, you know, most of them decide they don't want to take a statin. But, you know, I think that that's, that's the conversation to have with people rather than to say, like, your LDL is high, you need a statin. Like, it's more nuanced. And I think that what we will find, my strong prediction, I'll put money on it in 30 years if we ever do the study, is that, you know, we'll find that these are divergent phenotypes without the inflammatory markers, without the underlying issue that you're talking about that is causing you know, um, small dense LDL that is causing <clears throat> the populations of HDL and triglycerides to become disordered. I don't believe that this, this LDL phenomenon is the best metric of atherosclerotic mm -hmm. potential in people. And, and like you say, it's because the system is super saturated because, um, just because there's, there's so many particles, even at 900 nanomole per liter, you know, like, there, there are, there are, the system is saturated. You are still getting a ton of particles moving in and out. You just can't convince me that 1600 to 900 is, is the difference. It just doesn't make sense to me. And also the other problem is you have to assume that these evolutionary design macromolecules are inherently toxic in the machine they were designed in, you know, over millions of years, kind of crazy. I'll give you another just for fun. Uh, there's so many of these opposing uh, bits of evidence that I actually find it quite amusing. But you've got someone with a massive atheroma, right, in their archery here. And it's just about to burst. It's enormous. It's catastrophic. Just down a millimeter away or even across the wall, the endothelium and the archery is in perfect health with no issue. That person had the same LDL particle count. Why is atherosclerosis massively focal? It's in specific spots. You've got the same particle count throughout your whole vasculature, but some certain spots get massive atheroma, and right beside them, the artery wall is beautiful. I mean, it just clearly screams that it's not the big factor, you know? Uh, but, but anyway, the key thing is, I think, um, you've got a calcium scan to actually look for disease if you're not sure, and... I guess we need to worry most about the people at high risk of heart disease who have a high calcium score. And maybe they should tweak their diet to bring down the particles to be safe. That's their choice. Uh, and I do think uh, myself and Dr. Gerber's book, Eat Rich, Live Long, we put actually a series of dietary tweaks to stay low carb or keto, but to bring the particle number down. And that may be something people want to do, especially if they have a high score, they don't want to wait for a serial calcification test in a few years. They don't want to take the risk. Uh, and that's very, very valid. And young buckles like, like Dave Feldman and yourself, <laughs> you know, and people who are healthy and know they're healthy, 
Well, they can certainly go with the evidence and say, no, I don't think this is a problem. I'm just going to watch over the years. Yeah, watch it carefully. You know, I think we just watch carefully and and see what happens. And this is an evolving conversation because we can't we can't just we can't deny the efficacy, the value of ketogenic or carnivore diets for people. I mean, if you look in the community, you know, I just interviewed an OBGYN on my YouTube channel last night, and she noted that she had had PCOS in her pregnancies and was, you know, more obese and was pre-diabetic. I mean, with regard to diabetes and weight loss and these insulin resistant conditions, it's very clear that for some people, carbohydrate restriction is, is, is curative, is just miraculous. So we cannot, we cannot, you know, disavow the value of these interventions of, of a carnivore diet as well. If you look in terms of autoimmune disease, there are so many cases now of people having incredible improvement in, in autoimmune disease of the carnivore diet, you know, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, really bad psoriasis, eczema. We can't ignore these interventions and we need to continue the conversation around the things that we see with them. And I, I don't, I have trouble believing that something that improves insulin resistance, that improves autoimmunity, is on the other hand going to be bad for a cardiovascular outcome. I don't think that's the case. I think some people would argue, well, it could improve, you know, one thing, but then it's going to worsen another thing. I think that's bullshit. I think that you know, if the body is getting healthier, I don't think that's what's going to happen. But that's the conversation. And what I just want to see is that we continue the conversation and that people don't stop thinking about the value of these interventions. Because I'll tell you what, being in mainstream Western medicine, there are a lot of patients who are not getting better and don't have anything else. And all that mainstream Western medicine can offer them is symptom-focused pharmaceutical-based treatment, which is a real disservice. And these interventions with diet, ketogenic diets, carnivorous diets can really change the problem at the root. And that is miraculous in my opinion. So to stop thinking about how valuable they are and when we can use them is a great disservice to all the patients, you know, everyone in the world. Yeah, I agree. They're an enormous tool and you mix them with some other tools and they'll blow away pharmaceuticals on average in terms of beneficial effects. And we, we see it everywhere. I interviewed Michaela Peterson there a short while ago in Boulder, Colorado, and we went through all of that. And the carnivore, yeah, is, is it's fascinating to me, but I still I view it as the ultimate elimination diet. And yeah, as we talked and you went through, it brings all of the fully formed proteins, amino acids and much of what we need because they're similar animals. But but the other thing is, it's the ultimate elimination diet. I, I sometimes say to people, well, look, plants can be healthful, and that's fine. I eat vegetables myself, above ground, non-starchy. But we've got to be cognizant that all known problematic foods for humans, whether it's celiac or people having a problem with nightshades, or all the different humans who have an issue with foods, the only commonality with all of the problem foods is they're all from the plant world. They're never meat, fish, or eggs. And I kind of say, so look, if you've got an intractable problem and there's anything in diet that can help you and, and you've, everything has failed and you want to really try the ultimate elimination diet, well, obviously it's kind of meat, fish, and eggs. And maybe not even eggs because some people are, are allergic to the whites. Okay, fair enough. But um, if you do that for four to six weeks, you'll really find your best baseline with the least problematic diet in the universe. And then you can go from there. I mean, that's the way I view it. If It's not for me because I don't need to. Uh, but if I did need to, uh, of course I'd experiment with it if I, if I needed to. <laughs> wow. Just a quick break to remind you that this podcast is only possible due to funding from David Bobbitt and the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity. For middle-aged people, it is imperative to find out your heart attack risk by getting a CT scan of the heart and your CAC score. The new IHDA.ie website has all the scan resources. Please support us by visiting and sharing widely. Knowing your score, you can take action to stop the disease process and save your own life. It can even be as simple as removing sugar, refined carbs, and seed oils, i.e. processed food, from your diet. And now we return to the conversation. Yeah, you know, I think that that is one application of a carnivore diet. I think that um, people sometimes say it's the ultimate elimination diet. And I would say, yeah, absolutely. It's a very valuable tool. And I will admit that many people enjoy eating plants and find benefit from plants. And so 
I think that if people are thriving and they are kicking ass in all the ways they want to kick ass, sleep and energy and mental clarity and athletic performance and libido, man, I don't care what diet you're eating. I'm not going to tell you to change it. But if people are sick, if they're not doing well, if they're having autoimmune disease or, you know, sleeping problems or any of these other issues and, and they're not finding relief, then yeah, I think you need to start looking at the foods that are triggering you. And, and I would argue, I mean, this is just my perspective as, you know, um, sort of a carnivore based physician that most people, you know, will find improvement on this type of a diet and they can add back plants if they want. Most of the time they don't end up adding back plants because they feel better without them. And for the people that are, that feel like they're thriving, the other thing I would suggest just gently is that maybe they would feel even better without plants. We didn't really get into this yet. Perhaps we can say a few words about it. But if we, one of the premises of a carnivore diet is that if you look at plants, they don't want to get eaten. And, you know, I think there are some people who are more tolerant to plant anti-nutrients and toxins than others. But I, I believe that most people would feel better without plants in their diet because of these anti-nutrients and toxins. And a lot of times people don't even know how good they could feel. But I'm not, in, I'm not trying to convince people to eat a certain way. I just want to offer options for people who are not feeling well or want to improve. But if you really dig into the plant toxins, it's quite a fascinating realm. If you think about it evolutionarily, you know, plants are rooted in the ground. They can't run away. Animals can run away. That's their defense mechanism. So animals never evolved toxins in their, in their flesh, except for something like a puffer fish in the ocean. But that's pretty rare. You know, most animals don't have toxins. If you look at animal meat, eating an animal nose to tail, there's nothing toxic in there. And that's just the plain, you know, there's no toxin in there. But if you look at plants, whether you're looking at a brassica vegetable, like a mustard seed plant or kale or cauliflower, there are many plant anti-nutrients and plant toxins in that plant. And some people may be more or less sensitive to those. And that's why I think for some people, I would argue for everyone, an elimination of all the plants would really give you an idea of how good you could feel. And then you could see if you wanted to incorporate that back in. And a lot of times I get asked by people, what are the least toxic plants? I think most people want to eat plants just for social norms and things like this. And I say, that's fine. So I, I'll start with, I think that the most toxic plants are the, the seeds uh, of plants. I think that's where plants put the most anti-nutrients, whether it's lectins or um, digestive enzyme inhibitors or um, it, you know, things that are really going to mess up our digestion um, and plant pesticides, they're in the seeds. And so I would include seeds, I would include in the category of seeds, seeds, nuts, grains, and legumes. And that, that cuts across a lot of things that are held near and dear to people's hearts. Most people really like nuts, but nuts are seeds. And if you look at them, there's lots of toxins in nuts that really mess up our digestion. Seeds are a great example as well. So what's in the seeds? Well, first of all, there's lectins, which are carbohydrate binding proteins, which I think more and more people are starting to talk about, you know, and the idea is that these carbohydrate binding proteins in plants look very different than the lectins that are in animals and they can really interfere with our immune system. There's been some fascinating research done recently showing that in, in mice and rats, when they introduce a lectin, I think it's from a kidney bean or something, and perhaps from the nightshade family of vegetables and they irritate the gut they can actually see that lectin travel up through the vagus nerve into the brain of these animals and cause Parkinson's-like lesions in the striatum, wow. yeah, in the, in the substantia nigra of the brain. And so the lectins can travel through the superhighway of the vagus nerve, which goes directly from the gut to the brain, and they can be seen in the brains of these animals. So this is a wild concept that perhaps, and this is a big perhaps, the hypothesis is now that is our lectins contributing to Parkinson's or neurodegenerative diseases in people who are sensitive? There's a very interesting um, observational study in Denmark looking at incidence of Parkinson's disease in people who have had vagotomy, which is severing the vagus nerve, not to prevent Parkinson's, but usually for other medical conditions like increased gastric acidity. There are, you know, in the last 30 years, there have been surgeries where we would cut the vagus nerve. And in the people who have had vagotomies, there is a 40% less incidence of Parkinson's disease. And it's like, what is going on there? That is a crazy hypothesis, you know? Like, is this potentially this one of the superhighways by which plant lectins travel up through the gut into the brain? And is it causing neurodegenerative disease? Could it be contributing to Alzheimer's? You know, many of these diseases in the brain are actually autoimmune in nature. 
And I think that the whole idea around Parkinson's is autoimmune or inflammatories. They're all changing. I mean, the landscape is changing. So this idea that lectins can trigger autoimmunity, lectins can trigger inflammation is very intriguing. And lectins are in all plant foods. They're perhaps most strongly in the seeds, that is the seeds, nuts, grains, and legumes, but they're in all the parts of a plant. They're in plant stems, plant leaves, plant roots. So the avoidance of lectins could really help people um, in some situations. And then we move on to things like digestive enzyme inhibitors. I mean, we look at like beans. If you eat a raw bean, you are going to be sick as a dog. I mean, three to four raw beans um, off the vine will make you vomit. There are, there are all sorts of strong, strong digestive enzyme inhibitors in beans. Beans are highly toxic to humans. And it's the greatest irony is that there's this wildly inaccurate association with health because of the misunderstanding of blue zones as, you know, longevity centers based on what people are eating. If you actually look at the blue zones, they're probably based on clusters of genetic polymorphisms, which are favorable rather than anything that people are eating. And, you know, if you look at the blue zones, people are not incredibly healthy. There was recently a fascinating study published looking at the sperm quality of people in Loma Linda, and it was abysmal, you know? So the sperm, the sperm motility, the sperm numbers were much decreased in the vegetarians and the vegans in Loma Linda. So the idea that blue zones are healthy is just this fallacy. If people are living longer in blue zones, it may be because of their genetic polymorphisms that give them advantage rather than anything about the food they're eating. But legumes, highly toxic to people, lots of lectins. And then you move on to this idea of plant pesticides, and plant pesticides are actually pesticides produced by the plant to discourage animals from eating it in cabbage. There's this great article that I always refer to from Bruce Ames. It's called Dietary Pesticides, 99.99% All Natural. And the idea is that in any given day, most people on the planet consume about 1.6 grams of pesticides that are made by plants. These are plant defense compounds. And that we would consume, you know, 0.01% of that as things like glyphosate. I'm not saying glyphosate is good, but we need to realize that the relative contribution of pesticides from the plants that we are eating is mostly made by the plant to discourage animals from eating it. A fantastic example of this is the family in brassica vegetables of glucosinolates, which are found mostly in the seeds, but they're also in the leaves. So broccoli sprouts are all the rage and broccoli sprouts are made from glucoraphanin. Well, that's not true. Broccoli spouts have a compound called sulforaphane, which is made by glucoraphanin, which is a glucosinolate compound. So there's been a major misunderstanding here, and it's, it's quite an interesting story to tell really quickly. So we see this pattern in plants where they store a precursor molecule to a toxic molecule. And then when the plant is chewed, an enzyme combines with the precursor molecule to make the very toxic molecule. In this case, myrosinase combines with glucoraphanin to make sulforaphane. Sulforaphane is such a strong oxidant that if a broccoli plant had sulforaphane in it, most botanists agree that the broccoli plant would die. It couldn't sustain this. It's such a strong oxidant molecule. So sulforaphane is never present in a plant while it's living. It's only present in the broccoli sprouts or the kale when you chew it, when you chew it raw. It's a defense mechanism saying, oh, you're going to eat my seeds, you're going to eat my sprouts, you're going to eat my leaves. I'm going to make sulforaphane, and it's a toxin. It's an oxidant. Now, Rhonda Patrick has talked about this a lot and said that sulforaphane is great because it activates NRF2 in the liver, which it does. But here's the thing. NRF2, this gets into all these different rabbit holes. NRF2 can be activated by all sorts of things in the human body. It's part of a process of, you know, it it's, triggers the production of more glutathione, which ours, is our endogenous antioxidant. People often misunderstand the fact that sulforaphane is not beneficial. So forophane is a toxin. There is a concept of hormesis whereby a small amount of a toxin can trigger the, the production of increased amounts of glutathione in the human body. But so forophane is not directly beneficial to humans. In fact, it's directly harmful. And I'll tell you why in one second. But so forophane is doing something in the liver by triggering the NRF2 pathway that we can do on our own. Heat stress, cold stress, exercise, fasting, these all increase our glutathione levels and cause oxidative stress we don't need sulforaphane to have adequate or optimal levels of glutathione. So it's a redundant effect. Well, where is sulforaphane actually toxic? It can be directly toxic if you eat too much of it and you overwhelm the liver's ability to detoxify it. It can become a pro-oxidant and it's always directly toxic at the level of the thyroid. So this gets back to the idea of plant molecules as toxins. They're from a different operating system. We see this with all the plant molecules. 
whether, whether it's resveratrol or sulforaphane, whatever. Sulforaphane so circulates in the human body for a short amount of time before it's detoxified, and it competes with iodine at the level of the thyroid. So sulforaphane so is one of these family of compounds that are called goitrogens. There are a number of goitrogens, amiodarone, lithium, sulforaphane, so you know, and they, they inhibit the production of thyroid hormone at the level of the thyroid. So sulforaphane so is actually meant, or one of the defense mechanisms that we see with sulforaphane is it goes to the thyroid and inhibits thyroid hormone production. So all these people just crushing broccoli sprouts. I, I believe there are thousands of cases of hypothyroidism induced by broccoli sprouts. And if you look at my Instagram, there's multiple examples of people who have written me after I've been writing about this recently saying, hey, I was doing Rhonda Patrick's diet. I was doing the sulforaphane. I was crushing broccoli sprouts and kale green smoothies and I felt horrible. I got Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is an autoimmune disease. My testosterone dropped. So anyway, what we see uh, here is- You said to them, hey, tell it to Rhonda, right? I, I didn't tell you to eat that stuff. <laughs> yeah, I've said to her, I've said it multiple times on Instagram and social media, but she won't engage. I've said, oh, tell Rhonda, you know, like I want to talk to her, but you know, I think that she's hurting people. I believe she's well-intentioned and I respect her work, but I think that she's- She's hurting people with that recommendation. So formethane is a plant compound that is a toxin. It has a redundant effect on glutathione. We don't need it. And then it competes with iodine at the level of the thyroid and is, is toxic. So formethane has also been shown to induce tumors in, in rodents. And then um, so formethane has also been shown to induce the formation of oxidized omega-6 fatty acids because it's such a pro-oxidant. So things like 4-HNE and acrolein, which are what we talk about with regard to um, you know, uh, oxidized omega-6 fatty acids. So forafine has been shown to oxidize fatty acids in the membrane of cells and potentially even oxidize LDL. So this is a real problem. That, now that, the way you describe that there, Paul, I mean, and I certainly had a two-hour podcast with uh, Tucker Goodrich there on 4-HNE and, and seed oils and, and N6. Yeah, and absolutely, on the balance of what you've described there, I would be zero compelled to take that substance into me and actually I'd be strongly against it unless it had some real benefit that was proven. But what is it that people tend to pump plant foods for certain benefits? There's that tendency and most people don't tend to exalt animal foods for their benefits nearly so much. Is it just the world we live in likes the concept of plants are good. That seems to be the way the world is. I think so. And it's, it's just a wild thing. And it's why this carnivore thing is so disruptive and so interesting. You know, it's the idea that, wait a minute, think about it. Plants don't want to get eaten. They're, they're full of toxins. And there's a lot of people that don't tolerate those toxins well at all. Some people can detoxify them better than others, perhaps. And some people, you know, have a thyroid gland that's more robust and they may not see as much of an effect when they eat sulforaphane. But the, the exaltation of plant foods is, is really evolutionarily uh, a misunderstanding. I mean, I've said this before on my social media. Like, I see animal foods as the optimal human foods and plants are survival food. I really believe that humans are facultative carnivores rather than omnivores. And this is just a distinction that I would make as a teaching point for people. But I would say that an omnivore is an animal that, that gets unique nutrients from plants that it can't get other places. And I, I don't think that's the case. I think that humans are most well adapted to eat animals. I think that if we look at the fossil record and evolution, we've been eating primarily animals for the majority of human evolution. It's only within the last 50 to 60 years since we've been paying attention to epidemiology, which is badly confounded and virtually worthless, that people are starting to believe that plants are valuable. Um, and I would say that plants have had value throughout human evolution as survival food. They're inferior food. We know that we can eat plants without dying, but if you look at plant food, I believe it's ultimately a net negative. And this is what you see with vegans. In people who only eat plant foods, there's often an improvement in health at the onset within the first few months because they're eliminating something that might be triggering them, whether it's processed foods or sugars or dairy. But at long term, within two to three years, the, the trajectory for vegans almost without fail is nutritional catastrophe. We cannot eat plant foods as a sole source of human nutrition long term as humans. I would argue that point strongly. And you know, the corollary point is that if plants really are just survival food, you know, we can include them when we want to, if we enjoy them, but we should realize that animal foods are the real optimal food. And if there's any part of our life that is not optimal, 
people should consider eliminating plant foods and seeing if that part improves because I would say that there are many things about plants that that is highly there it's there from an evolutionary it's there from an evolutionary perspective to highly discourage animals from eating them we haven't even talked about fiber but we can talk about that as well the fiber thing, yeah. And there's one topic actually that occurs to me is Dr. Stephen Gundry. Um, he has the Plant Paradox book, which I think I never read it, but I, I would guess has a lot of the lectins and all the other plant problems in it. I do know that the, the vegetarian or vegan people were not happy with Gundry. But at the same time, even though he did highlight all of the concerns around plant foods, he has also done work and does a lot of work with APOE4 people with heart disease and inflammation. And he sees excessive uh, meats, fats, and cheeses particularly can make their inflammatory markers go up and go in the wrong direction. So it's like it, this could be the exception that proves the rule that if you've sustained metabolic damage uh, from bad foods over decades, that particularly cheeses and rich protein and fatty foods may not be ideal for you, maybe fish and, and things like that more ideal. This like low lectin plant diet, which I would disagree with. I think, you know, in an individual level, people can be triggered by lectins from any plant, um, potentially from an animal as well, although we don't really see it. And so he's kind of created this like unique system and said, oh, there's these plants have more lectins. If you eliminate these, you'll get less. And while that might be the case, I think all plants have lectins, and so that's important to notice. At the end of the book, Stephen Gundry essentially says that he's a plant-based diet advocate, however, though, and he argues strongly that animal proteins age humans, which is, you know, frankly, it's just kind of an unfounded claim. It doesn't make any sense, and he doesn't have any data to back it up. He uses rodent data to suggest that this may be the case, but he's misinterpreting the rodent studies quite badly, so it's, it's, very, it's very confusing and concerning that he's doing this, and it bothers me. So what he says about animal protein, he'll say animal protein ages us. And he just makes the statement. It's like, what do you mean animal protein ages us? How is animal protein any different than any other protein? Essentially animal protein, protein is protein. If it's from a plant, if it's from an animal, an amino acid is an amino acid. So to say that animal protein ages us is just kind of a ridiculous statement. He refers to mouse studies and rodent studies where they overfed the mice with methionine and what they saw when they overfed the mice with methionine was they did get a shortening of the lifespan of the mouse. Well, what you dig into there is this biochemistry around the methionine glycine balance and the idea that subsequently when they restricted the methionine in a mouse's diet, they got the mouse to live longer. They said, ah, see, here's the thing. Protein ages us, methionine ages us. And I think this is his argument that animal protein is higher in methionine than plant protein. Well, this is a misunderstanding of the data. What was really going on there was that by overfeeding the animals in methionine, they were imbalancing the methionine glycine ratio. And when they gave the animals a robust amount of methionine and just gave them glycine at the same time, the glycine extended the lifespan of the mice. So it was, it was the methionine glycine ratio. This is, so to say that an animal protein that is high in methionine is going to shorten your life is to completely misunderstand the biochemistry around methionine and glycine ratios. And this kind of goes back to nose to tail eating. One of the things that I say to people who are thinking about a carnivore diet or, or who are eating a lot of meat in general is that meat is a high methionine food and that you must balance that with high glycine foods. These are the connective tissues of an animal. This is the idea of nose to tail eating, that we must balance methionine and glycine in our diets. And we're not mice, but our biochemistry is pretty similar. And so Gundry is misinterpreting the studies here by saying high methionine muscle meat is going to age you. That's bullshit. It only, it only happens that way if you don't get enough glycine in your diet. And like I said, there are some really remarkable studies. I'm happy to pull one up and tell people this, the name of it. There are some really remarkable studies that show that when you actually supplement the diet of a mouse with glycine, they get life extension. It's just, and that's really the issue here, that it's, um, that it's the methionine-glycine balance that we need to think about rather than the amount of methionine. And, and actually, Paul, I'm glad you went through that because I had heard about the ratio before and that that was the explanation for these. And Walter Longo is another guy who's strongly anti-animal foods generally and the similar arguments that protein drives diabetes and cancer. And I, I think all of it is there, there's misunderstandings in there, as you've described one of them, but there's probably more as well. Yeah. 
There are many, there are many misunderstandings. Yeah. Walter Longo is, I think, misunderstanding the equation as well. And it's, it's a disservice because animal foods are so rich in nutrients and people are limiting them. They're going to develop nutrient deficiencies. So I'll just mention this paper to people because it's so striking. The paper is called glycine supplementation extends lifespan of male and female mice. It's in, it's in the aging cell. It's uh, September 28th. Uh, 2018. So people can look up that study as well. It's just a striking demonstration that, you know, and this is sort of what really frustrates me about the people talking about this is they'll say this on podcasts and then they never look, they never share their data. But if you actually nail them to the wall, they're, they're talking about mouse studies with excess methionine. And we say, Oh, well, that's, that's been disproven. Like you just need to look at the glycine studies to show that. And it, it actually, from my perspective, it's beautifully symmetric because it, reflects back to ideas around, you know, um, you know, eating nose to tail and getting enough glycine to balance your methionine. So the ideas that Gundry is suggesting around animal foods, aging humans are just, they're just fallacy. It's such a, such a shame that he's saying this. And then I would also say that he is underestimating the impact of lectins in many foods. Yeah. Oh, and fair enough. And uh, what about the cheese though? I think I, I always suspected when, um, with APOE4 people who, who have metabolic issues and sensitivities and maybe extensive heart disease, it's always been cheese and animal products, cheese and fat and protein. And I've met a lot of people and discussed with them this. And if you isolated cheese, which has the casein and other challenges from the animal foods with the APOE4 patients that he's dealing with, I, I wonder, is cheese carrying a large part of, of the can for changing inflammatory markers? Because cheese, in fairness, what do you think about cheese in general? It can cause reactions. It can cause issues. And maybe that's what's causing the effects, much more so, that they do appear to see. Yes, this is the problem with nutritional research. Now, if people will follow me on Instagram, they'll know that I'm not a huge advocate for dairy for exactly this reason. You know, some people do seem to tolerate dairy, but just like egg whites, you know, there are animal products, not usually not muscle meat, you know, but egg whites and dairy are animal products that do seem to trigger immunologic reactions in people. And ultimately, inflammation is an immunologic reaction. And I, I, I agree with you here. I have concerns about the immunogenicity of casein and whey, specifically A1 versus A2 casein, and the fact that casein can break down into casomorphin, which is an opiate-like compound down in dairy, which can change satiety signaling and all these things. And so, yes, these nutritional studies are badly constructed in that they often will combine heavy cream and they'll use heavy cream or, you know, a, a milkshake or a milk product as the source of either saturated fat in these APOE4 studies or the source of you know, the fats in these studies. And I've never seen a study with tallow. I don't think most researchers in the company in the country understand tallow, you know, they don't even know what tallow is, you know, just it's just a rendered animal fat. And I've never seen research with people just eating steak. Um, that's not an intervention. But, you know, if you look at the APOE stuff, I think it's a complex equation. But yes, I think that it's confounded by the fact that for some people, dairy may be particularly immunogenic. And what we're seeing there is a signal related to the immunogenicity of the proteins in dairy rather than anything related to saturated fat. And this kind of segues into discussions around saturated fat, lipopolysaccharide, endotoxin. You know, there's a lot of people talking about this right now, and I think that the data here is also very confusing. But if you look at the studies in um, increased levels of endotoxin, increased levels of LPS, which is lipopolysaccharide, and uh, feeding of saturated fat, you really have to dig into the study to see what type of saturated fat people were actually fed. And almost invariably, it's dairy. They're getting heavy cream. They're getting dairy fat, which brings with it casein and whey and other immunogenic proteins. And so the question is, when you're feeding someone dairy and you're seeing an increase in postprandial lipopolysaccharide, is that due to the saturated fat in dairy? Or is that due to the casein and the whey causing an immune reaction in the gut, potentially triggering leaky gut in these people. So it's a very complex equation. And 
researchers are, are too hasty to blame saturated fat because that's the story that everybody wants to make, even though it doesn't seem to be very clear when we look at lots of studies, it's not clear at all that saturated fat is bad for humans. In fact, in many cases, there's no evidence of that. But the researchers just want to blame saturated fat. It's like there's this bandwagon to blame animal foods and to blame saturated fat. So anytime they can get a result that suggests that, they jump to that conclusion without really thinking at a much more granular level and thinking, oh, there are all these other proteins in the milk. Nobody's actually giving you know, a single saturated fatty acid, a very pure experiment. You know, nobody's giving tallow or, you know, these things. There are some experiments with coconut oil, which look a little different than the dairy experiments. The other thing with the experiments with lipopolysaccharide is that they're often done in people with pre-existing insulin resistance. So they're sort of stacking the deck in their favor. The two studies I've seen are on women with PCOS and uh, a mixed population of men and women with metabolic syndrome. So these are people that probably already have leaky gut, you know, <laughs> they already have metabolic syndrome and they're saying, oh, when we feed these people with metabolic syndrome dairy, we're seeing increases in postprandial lipopolysaccharide. Well, that's, that doesn't really tell me much, you know, and interestingly in those studies, the fasting levels of LPS are normal in both groups, suggesting that it's just a reaction to the food and that, you know, that there's something uniquely immunogenic or inflammatory about the food they're eating. And I would strongly suggest it's not the saturated fat that's very evolutionarily inconsistent. Um, it's probably the immunogenic proteins in the dairy. Yeah, dairy is an enormous confounder on average, I'd say. And it, it's, it's tricky. And I think many of the researchers are simply not thinking uh, in that isolationist way to really isolate what the factor is. I, I, I just think, not true malice, but I just think they're happy enough to go in and do a study that's a fat study and just do it and, and, and get their data and get published and, and then move on to some other study. Uh, they're not, they may not even be aware nearly so much of these, these factors like the casein and, and the other, and the interaction with the immune system. I mean, arguably many of our diseases, even heart disease are inherently autoimmune type diseases. And you, hmm? Yeah, it's in fact, autoimmune is enormous. I saw a paper the other day and I know we have to wrap up shortly, but I saw a paper just released a week or two ago, I think. And it was quite fascinating, and I didn't send it on yet until I read it and go through their data. But the paper proposes, by looking and analyzing type 1 diabetics, which is non-diet induced, you know, it's more a genetic or other environmental issue, type 1 diabetics. And they found that the percentage of celiac uh, issues in the type 1 diabetic population was so large, combined with other analysis they did, they actually suggested in the paper that gluten and plant components may be a big chunk of the cause for type 1 diabetes. Now, that's not going to be a popular idea out there, right? Absolutely. I would argue that plants are the greatest contributor to human autoimmunity. And that's a radical statement, but I think that we will see more and more data, you know, really supporting that statement in the next five to 10 years. And so I'll repeat it. You know, I would argue that plants and plant toxins are the greatest contributor to autoimmunity in the human population. And so we'll wait and see, but I think we see evidence of that. Gluten, lectins, type one diabetes, celiac, these things cluster together. And I would also argue that most human disease that's chronic is autoimmune in nature. It's inflammatory and those are essentially synonyms. You know, um, I would argue that psychiatric disease is autoimmune um, for many people and then we get inflammation in the brain. I would argue that neurodegenerative disease, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are autoimmune atherosclerosis can be conceptualized as autoimmune, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, autoimmune, autoimmune attack on the myenteric plexus and the gut changing motility. We know that rheumatologic diseases are autoimmune, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis, you know, Hashimoto's, oh. etc. Yep. inflammatory bowel disease. These are all autoimmune. So you, I would challenge people to list for me a disease that is not autoimmune, that is chronic disease. I mean, sure, you get a cold that's not autoimmune, you get pneumonia that's not autoimmune, but a non-infectious disease, it's hard to think of one that's, that you can't really formulate as autoimmune as our understanding happens. And then the question becomes, what is triggering all this autoimmunity? You know, Western medicine might say, oh, just bad luck. And I would say, bollocks, you know, bullshit, <laughs> bullshit. It's your environment. And the first place you look is food. Yeah, and then you got to decide which foods and everyone has to research themselves. But certainly, Paul, you've given a huge amount of information here on on some of the foods 
from arenas that we need to be a little suspicious about and careful with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I'll just I'll just add briefly for people, you know, I would say I talked about the most toxic foods. I would say the least toxic foods, in my opinion, are probably the non-starchy fruits, things like avocado and olives. Um, you know, plants don't really put the same defense mechanisms into the fruit that they do into other parts of the plant. But um, I think that we must remember that fruits and fructose are not good for humans, generally speaking. And most fruits don't really have much redeeming value, whether it's high oxalates and blackberries and raspberries. I mean, a small amount people can probably tolerate, but I would say the non-sweet fruits are pretty benign, you know, for people. And that's a good place to start. Um, but be aware of where the, where the toxins may be. That's a great way to finish it. Yeah. The, the safer plant foods. And, and I always perceive as well that if, if someone wants to be really careful or they have a lot of disease going on, particularly heart disease. Well, if you focus more on fish, avocado, olive, and you know, these kind of very much less problematic plant foods and ideal animal foods like fish and grass fed fatty meats like lamb, it would be really good too. In fact, lamb has been called land salmon uh, in Ireland for its very high omega three to omega six ratio. So, you know, that could be a really targeted diet for someone who's being extra careful. Yeah, I think that that's reasonable. Yeah, I would just be careful not to exclude the the land, the ruminant animal foods. You know, I think that, that like you said, and like we said throughout the podcast, you know, well-raised, well-cared-for ruminants, whether it's a lamb or a cow, I mean, in my opinion, that's a superfood, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, and I guess I'm including lamb, but certainly beef as well, but maybe because of concerns around factory farming, antibiotics, and anything else that could trigger any immune or hormonal problem, someone with a lot at stake can just pay that little extra to get really well-reared meats. And yeah, excellent. So I think that's probably what I'm going to have now shortly tonight, though I do have another meeting now before I, I get to my evening meal. And what are you having this evening, Paul, to finish up? What are you having for dinner? It's morning here, my friend. It's morning here. Oh, well, okay, but lunch, what, do, you, do you do a lot of fasting during the day and have a main evening meal? I do, I do uh, two meals a day usually. And so I ate before we jumped on this call and I had uh, two grass-fed steaks, about 20 ounces of grass-fed organic steak with, um, I also eat salmon roe, which is a great source of phospholipid DHA. And I ate some uh, pasture-raised duck egg yolks. I don't eat the whites, but I ate some pasture-raised duck egg yolks raw. And then I had uh, a little bit of uh, extra fat and tallow on my steak with collagen for glycine and sea salt. And then I had some raw, previously frozen liver for um, the, all the other complementary nutrients there. So that's my nose to tail meal. And I'll probably repeat something like that in early afternoon. And that'll be the rest of my day. I'll usually only eat two, two meals a day. And I'll do like a mm, 16 to 18 hour uh, fasting window. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. I'm I'm really thinking about food now. <laughs> I've been sitting I'm sitting here as you talk and I'm thinking of my evening meal because it's now I think around probably around six thirty PM and I haven't eaten yet today. So I'm I'm looking forward to uh to something nice. <laughs> Great stuff. Hey, thanks a lot, Paul. We'll talk again and we'll keep watching the date and we'll see how this develops. I'm so excited. Um should I tell people where they can find me? Oh, yeah, I'm going to put some links when I post it. But yeah, go ahead. What's the, the main place? So um, I'm a functional medicine doctor here in the States. I work with people all over the world. I've got clients in Britain, in the UK, in Bangkok. So if people want to work with me, they can reach out to me via email. It's paulsaladinomd at gmail.com. I've got a YouTube channel where I'm sort of developing my own podcast and interviews with luminaries. Hopefully, I'll be able to have you on my channel soon. I thought you said luminaries. Luminaries. <laughs> Come on. Not me. Yeah, sure you are. Come on. Uh, so that's at Paul Saladino MD on YouTube. You can find that channel. I'm on uh, Instagram at Paul Saladino MD. I'm on Twitter at MD Saladino. I have a Patreon at Paul Saladino MD if people want to support me there. People can find more about me at my website, which is Paul Saladino MD.com. And I also have a Facebook page at Paul Saladino MD. So there's lots of places where people can reach out to me. Probably email or Instagram are the best. And please check out my YouTube channel. I'm trying to put out lots of good stuff there.
Excellent, Paul. And I'll put the link anyway to your main website, and that's going to have all your buttons for your social media too, I guess. Super stuff. Well, have a great rest of the day. Thank you, sir. It's been awesome. Thanks a lot, Paul. Good luck now. Bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen, a free viewing of the Widowmaker movie on the far right, and myself and Dr. Gerber's book, Eat Rich, Live Long, on the left. Otherwise, please do subscribe to the audio podcast. Thanks.